Thanks, Alexa. So for this fall, we're going to be studying First and Second Samuel. It's um, the Hebrew Bible lectionary for this year. Um, and I'm pretty excited about this because it's going to lead right up to Advent, where we talk about Jesus being of the lineage of David. And so now we're actually going to have a greater sense of what that means um, and that importance. And so we have Mike doing Mike's magic of the genealogy moment leading to the cross. And of course, every moment begins in prayer. And so David's story actually begins with Samuel's story. Samuel's the priest who finds him and anoints him that God works through. Um, and Samuel has a pretty amazing story as well that begins in this um, motherless um, woman's prayer. And so here I wanted to talk um, and to kind of finish out what we've been doing for this past month in terms of giving testimonies and share a little bit of my own testimony um, around prayer. And there are parts that I'm still very much wrestling with and working on, so I'm going to be reading um, a little bit too. Um, and so we come to this space to talk about the power of prayer. And this is really hard. Um, because how do you talk about something that can change everything while nothing changes? And, and how do you talk about the power of prayer when there are stories here that need that power and it hasn't come? And then how do you talk about the power of prayer when we pray really sincerely um, for something, but that that is received then not as sincerity, but as a threat that draws battle lines where one wins over and against another. I mean, it can be pretty cute, right? Like I distinctly remember when I was in early elementary school praying for how, at bedtime prayers, of how I wanted God to change my sister and what I wanted God to teach her. Um, and then remember the lecture afterwards from my parents of how, Kate, we don't pray against people. And honestly, I don't remember what they said. All I remember is feeling really disappointed and being like, what a waste of a good power. Um, but it gets less cute when you're in college and one friend tells another friend that her mom died because she didn't pray hard enough. And then you watch your dad and his faith fall apart in front of you because his brother's been in an accident. And scripture tells us that anything you ask for in God's name, God will give us. But Uncle Gray died. And then this month, I've worked with Danielle, um, who came in, who's homeless, looking for something. We got on the line with Baltimore County Shelters. Danielle has a social work degree from Morgan State University. And I listened as she walked the social worker through all of the different shelters and what she needed to check on to find out what was available for her. She knew more than the person whose job it was to find those and there wasn't anything for her. Hannah has a safe home. Hannah has a husband who loves her even in a time period when he could have very rightfully passed her on because she couldn't have kids and still comes and seeks after her and cares for her. Hannah's survival needs are met. Danielle's aren't. But yet Hannah's prayer gets answered, and Danielle's still homeless. And we all have these stories. We all have these experiences. And as much as I want to talk about prayer's power today and be excited and amazed by it, I, you can't ignore, I can't ignore, when it just doesn't happen, and it just doesn't show up, and how we deal with that. And I don't have a neat answer. I want so much to be able to wrap this up for myself. I mean, it'd be nice to be able to do that for you all too, but I really want it wrapped up for me. But I can't, because it's messy and it doesn't make any sense. And the best thing that I can do is name that, is name that it's not fair is named that for everything we read through scripture and who God is and how God works, it doesn't make any sense. And there's no way that I have found of understanding it. 
And I'm sorry, but the argument, well, God is limited because he's given us free will, so there's only so much God can do, just feels like such a cop-out. The only other thing I can do in the midst of this unanswerableness is to also name the danger of missing where prayers are answered and the miracles that do happen because of seeing only the losses and the misses. Because as much as they're not answered, they also are answered. How maddening is that? I don't know about any of you, but it drives me batty. But yet it's there. And so as much as the injustice is there, the hope is there too. And it's hard and it's messy and, and it's not packaged in any way that I would like it to be. Yet I can also name that at the same time that nothing changes in the unfairness of the outside circumstances, I also know when I've been in some of those situations how prayer has changed me on the inside and how that has been miraculous and how it has changed how I have been in those unjust situations and how I have approached them. And sometimes that brings no change at all. But other times that internal shift is enough that then other things in that outside shift from how I have changed in it too. And I can't find any pattern or any place why some things it, sometimes it does shift and why sometimes it doesn't. Um, but living in with the hope that it does is where I find myself for now. And the other part is experiencing slamming into a wall that I didn't see coming, trying desperately to get over it or around it and nothing working, those moments where everything's fine in life and then this one thing happens. It just comes out of the blue and it just shuts everything down. And that's where I've been lately. And I've had the experience of spending a week in prayer lately and finding a foothold of understanding that I had completely missed earlier. The wall's still there, except there's a possibility of a way up it now too. And I think what I'm trying to say is that for the first time in my life, seeing what is happening, even if it's not what I want or exactly what I've been praying for, doesn't feel like I'm selling out my expectation of prayer's power. The fact that the wall is still there and is still unfair and is still terrifying is something I'm beginning to figure out how to deal with because of that foothold being there too. The injustice and the hope are both there. And shifting my focus to the hope to the foothold has started to help me let that injustice, that wall be. And for a long time, when I started doing that, it felt like I was ignoring the injustice, that I was letting something be that I should never just let be. But there's something that's shifting, and I'm reading this because it's so hard to put words to. Um, but I think what's happening is finding a way to be present in the both and. That the shift of focus to the way up and over the wall doesn't necessarily minimize the injustice of the wall or the fact that it's wrong. But that making that shift also feels that I've gotten out of my own way in a way that I haven't before and can now see God at work in a way I wouldn't have caught I wouldn't have seen that foothold if I hadn't shifted my focus away from the wall. But all of that hope and yay, there might be a foothold is exhausting. It's exhausting living in that kind of teeter-tottery space suspended on a wall looking for another foothold. It's so much easier to just say her mom died because you hadn't prayed hard enough. It's so much easier to not grapple with why righteous prayers go unanswered. And thank God we have the book of Job in scripture. 
we have an entire book dedicated to this one question, to this one trouble, to remind us to grapple because Job demands an answer for God. I know that it says and Job didn't open his mouth or sin against the Lord and asking in the first two chapters, but if you keep reading, there's 35 chapters of him opening his mouth and demanding an answer from God. And God comes to Job, and God answers Job directly. There are very few people in Scripture that God comes to speak directly to in response to their cry, and Job is one of them. But that answer never once mentions the wall, never once mentions all of the injustice that Job is railing against. Instead, God demands Job to gird up his loins like a man and answer him. And what we have in chapter 38 and on is one of the most beautiful and powerful descriptions of creation that I have ever read. It goes way beyond, and God created, and it was good, which is true. It is good. But we have this glimpse into how hard God worked for that good. Because God asked Job, were you there to measure to decide and to determine the foundations of the earth? Were you there to walk the recesses of the deep to the gates of death? Were you there to put in the boundaries of the waters when they burst forth from the womb, to set and to shut the doors around the sea? Were you there to cut the channels for the rain, to water the earth even in the desolate places? And it goes on and on and on. And at the end of it, there's this shift that happens for Job too. And it's immediate shift. He spent 35 chapters railing against that wall. And after God talks to him, not about the wall, Job says, I have uttered what I did not understand. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear but now my eye sees you, and I repent in dust and ashes. What? Part of me still gets really mad at that. Like, excuse me? Like, God's the one that made the pact with the accuser in the first place to bring all these calamities against Job, and now Job's the one repenting at all of this? Oh, no. Yay, he gets a new family. That does not replace the old family. That is inexcusable, especially for a God who values human life. And I get really cranky and really worked up. This is me not as worked up as I get up at home about this passage and how unfair it still is. Except Job is the one who gets to rail, not me. It's his life, and all of a sudden, he's ready to do something different. And I don't know what that shift is. I don't know what that shift is internally, but there is something more that he touched, something more that happened that made it okay, that changed everything for him, even when nothing had changed. I got worked up. I had a head cold. I've got sinus stuff going on, so just a second. So here we have Job on the one hand, where everything has changed when nothing was changed. And then if we go back to the temple with Eli and Hannah, there's Hannah battling another of life's injustices, one just as personal as Job's, though unlike Job, Hannah's complaint gets addressed directly, right? Her story ends with a baby and absolutely no wall. That wall gets obliterated, gets blown through. And we see her completely vulnerable, launching herself into God's care, and the priest who sees that sacred moment as irreverence and disregard for the Lord. I don't know if we're ever going to be able to understand prayer's power. For Eli, it's disrespect. For Hannah, it's life blood. For Job, it's an internal shift. For Hannah, it's all of her outside external situation changing. 
For Job, it's a way up the wall. For Hannah, it's no wall. But something has happened. Something changed for Job, and something changed for Hannah and Eli too. Because the story ends with Hannah pregnant and with Eli apologizing. In one person's persistence and another's admission of wrong, and a whole lot of God, something happens. And this is where I sit, unable to explain any of it, knowing that one person's sacredness looks like another person's disregard and disrespect, knowing that one person's answer and what they needed for me is ridiculous and crazy from the outside looking in. But all I can ask, and all I can pray, ironically, is that we can find our way in the midst of that. That in the midst of our own persistence, in the midst of our own willingness to admit wrong, in the midst of our own commitment to hang in a teeter-tottery, impossible balance on a wall, caught in between persistence and change, that we will find prayer's power and we will find the way of the Lord. Amen.